Well, good afternoon. Good to see everybody again. So here we are at our uh, fifth meeting already. Time flies when you're working with artificial intelligence. <coughs> so I hope you, you looked at the um, slides uh, show that we asked you to look at last time. So you could see Chris Darkin talking about unsupervised learning. And now today we're moving a little, continuing ahead, and we're gonna be talking about human-machine teaming, human-machine interaction. They're close together. But uh, how many of you are familiar with the idea of a CAPTCHA? You've seen those when you try and log in, you, they give you something to see if they can distinguish you from a robot trying to log in. Well, that, that idea was invented <coughs> at Carnegie Mellon some years ago to, uh, it's kind of a re reverse Turing test. You know, remember the Turing test of trying to distinguish, trying to see if you could distinguish between a machine and a human? Well, this is a little sort of mini test there that humans easily pass and machines can't do. Or, although some of us humans sometimes find these captures a little hard to, to deal with. but. Uh, so there's, a, there's an idea where humans are good at doing something that machines aren't good at doing, and we can use it to make the distinction. And we want to make sure a human being is logged in, and that's why somebody invented the CAPTCHA. There's a, another somewhat more grandiose example. Is, uh, you, may, you may remember in 1997, there was a famous chess match between IBM Blue supercomputer and Gary Kasparov, the world's grandmaster chess player. And the, the, the IBM machine beat Kasparov. And the newspapers were all full of headlines like, chess is dead. And Kasparov said, Kasparov said, no, it's not. And he invented a new way of doing chess, which he called advanced chess. But it was, a, it was teams, you could bring whoever was a chess player brought their own laptop with them or some kind of connection to their own computer and they had a chess playing program on that computer and the player in the tournament would consult with their computer program and decide what moves to make. And this combination of, the, of a pretty good chess player, not a world-class chess player, and a pretty good chess program was usually good enough to beat the best machines. There was something about putting the human intelligence together with the machine that made both of them more uh, effective. And that's, that's the topic of what we want to talk about today. So there's this notion of bringing the two together, playing together for their strengths. And there's also a notion that's sort of hidden in there which we need to talk about, which is the interface. Is how do you design the interface so you can the human can talk to the machine in a sort of the human language that the human is good at. And to tell you all about this is today is Professor Rudy Darkin. Uh, I've known Rudy for a long time. He was, he was on the campus when I first came here. So I came here 20 years ago, so he's been here for more than that. But he's been associated with the MOVES Institute for a long time and the Center for Homeland Security, I guess, also. And, and so he's had a lot of experience in this area of user interfaces and, and um, machines and humans getting along amicably and symbiotically. So with that, I introduce Rudy and all yours, Rudy. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, I, I, I've been studying um, uh, what, what was called human-computer interaction and uh, usability engineering. More recently, it's referred to as uh, user experience or, use, or UX um, for 30 some odd years. Um, and for most of that time, um, we thought of it as a really challenging design problem because um, you're designing for people and the field has been mostly about how you um, optimize the man-machine interface and you're figuring out 
what is the workflow, what are the tasks my users are doing, how do I lay things out in sequences, how do I um, keep them from making errors when they make errors, how can I help them to recover very quickly. These, this is what UX people do. Um, and come to realize um, through time um, the that, that subfield of computer science has changed a lot over, th over 30 years, and certainly not because of the user side of it. At best, we're the same we were 30 years ago. You could argue we're worse. Um, but um, the, uh, all the different technologies that we're using, um, and, and a lot of the, this has had to do with um, different display technologies, different interaction devices. I mean, who really knew what a touch screen was or a touch pad, touch sensitive pads? All these things have been invented over those years. We had to figure out what they were good for and how to fit them into the process. So um, UX, in my view, has actually been more, um, more of a process oriented thing than a design oriented thing, because I've always argued that um, even if you're not the most talented designer in the world, if you follow a good process, you're still going to end up with a pretty decent product. Um, you, 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 yes, some, somebody who's uh, more talented than you might come up with something better, but if they're undisciplined and don't follow a good process, not necessarily. Um, and then you start thinking about what AI does to this, and you start thinking about how um, it's so pervasive in what we do today and the availability of AI into our software, even software developers who don't know anything about AI, uh, let's say being able to tap into speech interfaces and those sorts of things that are full of AI, they don't know anything about that, um, it's all become really easy to do. So all of a sudden you got this new design problem. You got this new design problem because you're trying to figure out how the, the, my user, through an interface, is com communic communicating with the system, but then I have AI behind the system that's got to be communicating back to my user. Okay, so that's, we're going to talk about that. Um, so we start off with this thing called uh, Kasparov's Law, and the, the gist of it, and Peter was alluding to it, this is just a little bit more, more detail to what he just said. Kasparov's Law states that weak human plus machine plus better process, better meaning better than the other, um, is superior to strong human plus machine plus inferior process. Okay, now you should all be asking, what do you mean by process, right? That's the, 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 the loaded word in this is process. Because we know what the human is, and what we're saying, in the context of what Peter just said, a weak human would be a chess player like me. Know the rules, know how to play, certainly not particularly good, right? versus somebody who's a really good player, okay, and we both get a machine, okay, what's this process? What's this process? That process defines how this works with this. Okay, and that's your challenge, is to figure out how you're going to make those two things work together. Think as uh, a backdrop behind this. Um, Aegis ships have known how to automate fire for 25 years. We've yet to let them do it. True? I mean, that means to say you don't need a human to fire missiles from, a, from, a, from an Aegis ship. You don't need the human. The system will do it all. We never let them do it. We always have human oversight. Always have human oversight. Very similar to the scenario that Peter just painted Less, the stakes are quite a bit lower, but playing chess, right? I've got a machine advising me what I'm going to do. I get to decide. It doesn't decide, I decide. Okay, what's that process going to be? How are these things going to work together? All right, so the, um, we're, we're talking about this, we're designing this collaboration between human and machine where the human is responsible for tasks that he or she does best and the machine is responsible for tasks that it does best. All right, so we're going to list those later on, it, the general characteristics of the sorts of things people do particularly well versus the sorts of, sorts of things that machines do particularly well. All right, so here's an example everybody's seen a gazillion times. 
this an intelligent interface? And if it is, where is it? Where's the intelligence? Go ahead. So I think once you start typing in a word uh, based off your previous search history, it's going to give you a recommended search mm -hmm. before you finish your search. Mm -hmm. I, I almost agree with everything you said. It's not just based on your user history. It's based on everybody's user history. Right? You can do a search you've never done before, and, and it starts filling in the right answer before you even finish. You've never done this search before. How could it know? Right? It's based on what everybody else is doing. Okay? It's the power of Google. That's, what, that's what, why Google is Google. That was, that's their secret sauce. Okay? Um, so there's a lot of AI here. There's a lot of AI here. Um, the, um, and it, and it's, it's extraordinarily powerful. All right, another one. Is that an intelligent interface, and where is it? Different flavors of intelligence here, too. An Alexa device is inherently what we call a natural language interface. It, has, it doesn't have, well, I should say it doesn't have a visual component. That little blue ring is technically a visual component. It tells you something. Essentially, that blue ring says, I can hear you. It doesn't say, I understand you. It doesn't say, I know what you mean. It, all it says is, I hear you talking. It's really all it does. So predominantly, this is a natural language interface. How does a machine understand English? And does it only work for English? Somebody comes in talking Spanish, does it not know what you're talking about? Large percentage of the population on this planet don't speak English. They, are we not able to sell Alexa devices to them? Right? Okay, that in itself, just figuring out, you just made noise coming out of your mouth, and I understand what you just said, is AI. Okay, that, in, that alone is AI. Okay, but there's more than that. What else is going on behind this thing? I know what else Alexa can do. Alexa knows, can actually distinguish between speakers. If you, if you have an Alexa in your home, you and your spouse both talk to it, it'll know the difference between you. Right? If you have, a, you have your own uh, Amazon account with your own shopping list, and she's got her own with her own shopping list, when you add something to your shopping list, it doesn't go on her list, it goes on yours. How does it do that? It knows the difference between your voice. Okay? Um, so there's a lot of AI here. There's a lot of AI here that goes on behind the scenes that you kind of take for granted. Okay. This is one of my favorite examples, not for good reasons though. Um, is that an intelligent interface? Does anybody know what this is? Anybody remember back far enough? The old query for uh, Microsoft. Mark. Yep, yep, yep. It was, it was called Clippy. It was part of the uh, uh, Microsoft suite. You usually would have seen it in Microsoft Word. So back in days gone by, you could you could open up a Word document and start writing, Dear Mom. And this guy would pop up and say, it looks like you're writing a letter. Do you want me to help you? And if you said yes, it would maybe fill in the date, or it might try and figure out if it was a business letter. And um, I don't want to throw darts at it too much, because it was actually a very honorable attempt, and we learned a lot from it. But people hated this thing. They really hated it. Um, uh, and it violated a number of rules that we now really understand from an interface perspective when you are coupling people with AI. All right? Um, and we'll get back to it a little bit later, but it has to do with how you interrupt me, when you interrupt me, what the form of the interruption is. Okay? You violated just about all of it. Okay? So it wasn't that, that was not. But what it was trying to do behind the scenes was not so be very bad. What if instead of Clippy just jumping in and grabbing a third of my screen space and trying to, trying to take over my task, what if it would have just given me a subtle little cue in the corner that said, hey, there's a helper here that might be able to assist you with something if you want it. Much subtler, right? I can ignore it if I want. And if I don't respond in 30 seconds, it just disappears and goes away, right? You could have ma imagined an interface like that that is far more palatable, palatable to people. They wouldn't have hated him so much. Okay, we'll come back to that. But um, it was Clippy was doing some pretty innovative stuff. Just wasn't the interface was not right. 
Is that an intelligent user interface? And where's the intelligence there? Anybody do this for a living? You know more than I do. There's quite a bit of intelligence here. Quite a bit of intelligence. Right? Go ahead. So you could say, you know, there's a lot of supervised learning, so it looks like a radar. I don't know much about this. Mm -hmm. so it could be, you know, having the radar acquisition, giving you what it thinks that it's seeing. And right. Would that human interface actually be right. okay or not? Right. You got a lot of sensors. Sensors and pattern matching are just like, like this. They go together all the time, right? Particularly on a ship when you've got multiple sensors and you're trying to do like an identification of a target and you're not doing it off one sensor, you're doing it off of several sensors trying to figure out what's going on, right? Because you can't be wrong. Um, so there's a lot of AI behind that, okay? Um, there's an area here of that this has been like a ripe area for research as long as I've been doing this, and the, 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 there really hasn't been a lot done. Um, but it has to do with uncertainty and how you represent that uncertainty to your operator. Right? So if I'm this guy sitting here and my CO is standing over my shoulder asking me to identify a target, I not only want to give him an answer, I'd like him to, give him, I'd like, I'd like him to know how certain I am from I'm really not comfortable with this to I'm dead certain and whatever the gray is in between. Seems like I'd want to give them that, right? That, I, I, I can't generate that myself. It'd be great for the system to be able to do that for me. And you can think of lots of other applications where there's intelligence behind the scene um, giving you advice, giving you instruction, right? But with uncertainty. I'm not absolutely certain about what I'm telling you. Right, and you want to be able to know with what degree of certainty you're talking to me. How right. Does that what? How does that radar system tell the analyzer the degree of certainty? Because all it does is just spit out like what it's identifying. Yeah, yeah. This is what I'm saying. It, it's, it's, it's. That's why I'm saying it's, a, it's a ripe area for research because it doesn't, it, 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 doesn't it does not really do that right now. It does not really do that right now. Um, but that's like an area that I know there's, there's folks working on that. And how do you visualize it? in such a way that that operator knows what to report, okay? Uh, in avionics, where's the intelligence here? Any aviators here? Right, it's a similar, similar sort of a situation. Lots of sensors, lots of sensor fusion, lots of built-in uncertainty, et cetera, et cetera, all that, okay? All right, so what you end up with is something that looks like this. You have this symbiotic continuum, fancy term for all the way over here, I'm fully manual, you're not helping me a bit. All the way over here, I don't even need to be there. You can handle it all yourself, right? And the reality is that we very rarely live at each or e either of the extremes. We're someplace in between, right? So, and down on this end, because I'm doing most of the work, the AI is augmenting me. And over on this side, I'm augmenting the AI. And you can imagine, there's no right and wrong here. I'm not making a judgment on, on, on whether one side of this is better than the other. It's very application dependent based on what makes sense. There are a lot of situations where I really want the system to do most of the work. I just want some oversight. That's all I want. I want to be able to look over its shoulder and go, yeah, that's good. That's not so good, right? You just learned a lot about reinforced learning. What do you think the reinforcer is doing? Right? They're watching the AI perform. They are cueing it. This is good. Good answer, not good answer. Good answer, not good answer. Anybody in machine learning will tell you, you don't just throw that away. That's gold. You, you turn that right back into the, into the training set so that the next time, it'll do better. Okay? But that human is augmenting the AI in that scenario. Right? And you can imagine, you can imagine certain tasks that currently live to the right of center on this chart may someday shift to the left because of that, because the data sets get better and better and better. Simple um, document processing. Take a document, feed it into a, a machine learning algorithm. Machine learning algorithm does categor categorization, tags things, tells me this is what's in here. Okay? Uh, 
you guys, you know, uh, the, 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 the plagiarism software you guys all have to run through when you graduate is doing exactly that. There isn't somebody doing that by hand. It's all by machine. It's all by machine, okay? Um, and the reason why it's as precise as it is is the number of times they've actually washed through it. And all that feedback, it just keeps getting better and better and better. Right? So you've got to imagine, initially when they started, they were probably on this side, right? Uh, I'm sorry, over on this side, right? Where you've got the humans doing a lot of the work, but the AI is kind of helping me, right? Give, giving me a leg up, and then I fix things a little bit, you know? But the more I fix it, I can shift over to this way, all right? Okay, so um, what we're talking about here is when we get this teaming is... Um, we're, like we said, we're rarely at, on either one of the extremes. So what we want to do is we find, find the balance between what the human does well, what the machine does well. And I want to maximize the efficiency and capability of the overall system. So we always, whenever we, fr from, from an HCI perspective, when we look at um, any man in the loop, no matter what the, to, to what degree the man is in the loop, right, we always throw a rope around the whole thing. We never look at the human. In independent of the system. We look at the, the system. In fact, we, in our language, the system includes the human. It has to include the human, right? And if you design something in such a way that the weakest link is the human, then you're, that's your weakest link because you can't, you can't avoid it. You can't avoid it. All right, so our challenge is to find the right balance of what the user, user should be doing or what the user has to do or does best versus what the computer does, all right? So, you guys have seen this before, right? We'll just watch Tesla take us for a test drive. How much AI is hiding in this thing? And now the stakes are high again, right? Has to do the braking, has to know what lane he's got to be in. Now, um, first of all, this is now shifting from the left side of that line to the right side. The human is augmenting the AI. It's why he's sitting there, right? If I wanted to fully automate, he wouldn't be sitting here. He'd be sitting over there. He'd be sitting in the back seat taking a nap, right? which we may get to at some point, I don't know, right? But right now, for the foreseeable future, you're gonna have to have a, an operator sit, sitting right there. So if this thing, if this algorithm burps at some point and does something unexpected, you gotta have a, the operator right there to take over, okay? But um, you see to what degree, what are you shifting, right? So what do we have here? You got sensors on the car, right? You've got algorithms, you've got your map data coming in. You know, you can imagine what these algorithms look like and what it's actually doing. Okay? All right. So what we want to do, here's a list. I don't claim that this is complete, but just get, get you started, right? You got to do what you do best. What do computers do best? They're calculators. They're elaborate calculators. They can do calculations you can't or that would take you a very long time, right? So they calculate. They're good at comparing. They're logic machines. Um, they don't mind doing something a billion times in a row. It might take them a little while, but they don't mind. They don't get bored. They'll do it just as well the billionth time as they did it the first time. Um, they, deal very, they, they can deal with very large data sets. Um, they require a certain level of certainty, right? Um, computers are inherently inherently deterministic machines. Computers are, right? Whenever we, we, we fake them, we fake non-determinism. Anytime you look at something that seems to be non-deterministic in a computer is not real. Even, a, even the, the quote-unquote random number generator your operating system gives you is not really random, it's pseudo-random, right? Why? Because it's a deterministic machine. Versus if I do a random number generator that's any one of you, I have no idea what's going to come out of your mouth. It could be something, I have no way of determining it, right? You are non-deterministic. People are inherently non-deterministic. So 
And then you want to ask yourself, this is where sci computer scientists come in, you know, if you, you, you learn about computability. One of the things you ought to be able to do when you finish a computer science degree is be able to look at a problem and say that's computable or it's not. Okay, that's an important thing. You've got to know whether it's even, whether it's solvable. It doesn't matter if it's hard. I is it solvable? Okay, right, that's computers. Let me switch over on the human side. Humans are really good at deciding things. On what basis uh, do computers uh, decide things? They're deterministic. They determine them on the basis of what you just told them, right? So if there are other variables involved, humans are better. We're good at making judges, judgments. We're good. We can empathize, right? I can change the way I respond to something based on what I'm reading from you, right? He's having a bad day. I'm going to cut him a break, right? He's really pissed off at me. I'm going to do something different, right? I can, I, I'm empathizing, right? It's what uh, Minsky called theory of mind. It's my, my ability to model in my brain what's going on in your brain. And you all do this. You all do this all the time. You're always monitoring what's going on around you. You have little models that you're building about what's going on in somebody else's head. Okay? Except your children. You'll never know what's going on in their heads. Um, so uh, the, uh, uh, we have preferences, right? So we like certain things. We don't like other things. We can say that's pretty, that's ugly. Machines will just do what we tell them to do. We get tired very easily. We get bored. Um, but we also, we're really good at functioning in ambiguous environments. We handle uncertainty way better than the machine does. Okay, so take just, you know, again, I'm not making a judgment call. I'm just making lists of things I do well and things my computer does well. All right, so now this gets back to what Peter was talking about here. Let me watch my time. Uh, uh, called freestyle chess. And so, coming after Kasparov uh, lost to Deep Blue in uh, 97, he came up with this idea that um, the uh, uh, that that a whole different form of, of chess em evolved, where it's not a human playing another human at chess, and it's not a machine playing another machine at chess. It's a human computer team playing another human computer team. So you can see that we're back to this: somebody's augmenting somebody here, right? Um, so I have my I can just sit there if I want as a player. I can just play the game. Computer's seeing exactly what I'm seeing. I can just take every move it gives me and just play it if I want to. In other words, I'm augmenting it, right? On the other extreme, I could say, hey, I'm a really good, I'm a Kasparov type player. I'm going to play the best of my ability, right? But this, this guy's helping me out. He's going to maybe, if, 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 I'm going to see what he comes up with because maybe he's going to come up with a move I hadn't thought of, right? And I can play that out in my head and I can see whether I like it or not. Okay, so you can imagine that you look at a room full of people playing with their computers and they're on different points on that continuum. They're, nobody tells them where to be. One guy is only playing what the computer does, the other guy rarely plays it at all. Okay, all right, so we're tracking with that? All right, so what starts to come up is what are called anti-computer tactics. Now I know that you have a computer helping you play chess. So now I purposely play my game in a way to confuse a computer, to do things that a computer is not going to expect me to do, right? To make it very difficult. Because if you're leaning too hard on it, I'm going to make it. I'm going to try and make it really hard for that computer to keep up with me. Okay? So that's what pops out of here. Uh, and what happened in 2005? You had two amateurs using three PCs um, won a grandmaster level tournament. So. It really works. And there wasn't anything really special about these amateurs. They were good chess players, but they weren't grandmaster level. So here is a process for designing. Remember I said user interface, I think, I think of it more as a process than it is a, an actual design exercise. Um, so what we always do when we're developing a user interface, you've got to do your needs analysis. I'm building a piece of software. I'm building a, well, let's, let's use the word, word we used before. I'm building a system. And there's going to be a person or one or more people that are inside of this system. And there's also software and computers, one or more computers, inside of this system. Right? My needs analysis. What are we doing this for? What problem are you solving? You better know that before you ever get started. All right? You always have to do that. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do a task analysis. I'm going to try and figure out, OK, what has to be done in order to accomplish this? All right? One of the things that we are always worried about in user interface, particularly from our human perspective, is who needs to know what when. 
So I make sure that I have delivered you the information you need so that you can make your next move, whether I'm playing chess, uh, I'm, a, I'm an Aegis op uh, you know, uh, uh, Spy 1 radar operator, uh, I'm whatever, right? Whatever it is I do, right? I, I got to have, I got what information do I need? I don't want too much information coming at me because then I get overloaded and I can't, I can't function. I want just what I need, but when I need it, all right? I get at that through a task analysis. Then I come down to a functional analysis, right, where I say, uh, I'm going to determine which parts of this have to be performed by my user, and everything else will shift over to the computer. Okay, now when I teach this course, a lot of times we don't spend much time on functional analysis a at, 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 much at all because we don't have time to do anything that has any real AI in it. But if you're going to build something that's got AI in it, you better be thinking about this and, and give a good bit of time uh, into your functional analysis so that you're figuring out how you're going to dole out this task, right? How is my user and my system, how are they going to work together? Right, so then, uh, now I actually do my uh, uh, design. I'm, I'm gonna, I'll just show you a couple of designs here in a minute. And then, what you really learn in a UI class is these last three steps. You learn how to prototype, user test, and repeat, and you keep cycling, cycling, cycling until you get what you want, okay? And the only thing that's different about this in a, in a, in a, a, a human AI team type of a system is this, uh, this particular step becomes a lot more important. Becomes a lot more important. All right, so some simple principles when you are designing a, a system uh, f uh, for, f with, with intelligence behind it. First, you need to make clear what the system is capable of doing. What is the system capable of doing? So your user knows what is the system going to do for me. Can you imagine our Tesla example? You know, if the user if the user doesn't understand that this system doesn't operate particularly well, let's say in the fog or the rain, right? And he has the wrong expectation, you're going to have a problem, right? So you got to know he needs to know what the limitations are uh, of what this thing is actually going to be able to do for me. You need to be able to in interrupt the user intelligently, okay? Um, and so the, the, and, and the beauty of this that gets lost in the noise all the time is that my user is probably already sitting at the computer doing stuff. I already know what you're doing. So uh, there really isn't much of an excuse for interrupting you badly, right? I mean, there are a lot of other instances in your life where, you're, where you get interrupted at an inopportune time. And when you think about it afterwards, you say, yeah, well, he really couldn't have known what I was doing at that, at that time, and so it's okay, right? Um, your computer doesn't get that excuse. I'm sitting in front of you doing something. You know what I'm doing. You should be able to know whether it's okay to interrupt me or not, right? If I'm in the middle of a Zoom call, this is not the time to be giving me some funky alert that's telling me about something. Yeah, I'm, in, I'm in a meeting. You know I'm in a meeting. Look at the process stack. See the thing that says Zoom? I'm in a call. All right? So don't interrupt me right now. Save it. Interrupt me as soon as I get out. Easy, right? But they don't do this. They just, all they know how to do is, oh, something important just happened. You got to know about it right now. No, I don't. Wait. Okay? So interrupt intelligently. Um, efficient uh, invocation, correction, and, dis and dismissal. This means invocation is the way the interruption occurs, right? The way correction is done and way, the way you might dismiss it the way you might dismiss it, right? So think about um, another example that has all those pieces but doesn't actually uh, uh, implement them particularly well is Outlook events, right? You get that little bling down in the right-hand corner of your screen, right? It doesn't care what you're doing, when you're doing it. It always comes up, but it invokes, it triggers, right? And then I can either do something about it, gives me a, an opportunity to do something, or just dismiss it, okay? Uh, you want to be able to remember recent interactions and string together in a dialogue. Alexa only recently has had the capability of you talking to her without naming her every single time you say something. So if I say, Alexa, turn off the lights, and I immediately want to say, Alexa, turn the lights back on, right? In the past, I would have had the username twice. Now I can say, Alexa, turn the lights off, turn the lights on. 
And as long as the gap between those two isn't too long, she'll remember you were just talking to me and you said something I know. You just said something else I know, you're talking to me. Right? Okay? So th that she's starting to get a little smarter about figuring out. Now the next thing will be if she can figure out from the context of what it is you're talking about that you are probably talking to her. Right? Um, so you, don't be too surprised if in the future she's going to get a lot smarter about um, when, she, when she listens to you and when she does things. Okay? All right. Um, and then uh, you want to learn from user behavior. So you want to be able to adapt over time. You want to be able to adapt over time if you can. I'm going to watch my time here. Um, I'm just going to show you a couple of other quick things here. There's some videos, but we'll skip over them, so we'll have time for some questions. This was a recent thesis uh, Major Keller had where the AI in this one is he's actually, um, this is a VR interface to a, um, a, a multi-UAV planning system. Right? The AI behind the planning system is pretty sophisticated stuff. But what he does on his side, on the user side, it can't know what, what do you want me to do. So what he does is he uses the VR interface, this is what you see through, through the display, is you use the VR interface to lay out, um, uh, lay out uh, milestone points uh, along a path, and then the software figures out everything else about what these guys are going to do, and when they start doing it, um, if they run into a problem, whether it's weather related or maintenance related or what have you, um, you get alerted and you can make adjustments off of that, right? But it's uh, actually an interesting example because it starts with the, uh, the, with the user doing a lot of work, right? He's got to, this thing can't really figure out what it is you want to do. You have to do the work. But then, as you start executing, the roles shift, um, and all of a sudden the, uh, the, the system takes over and is doing the lion's share of the work, and you're just monitoring it at that point. Okay? Um, this is an interesting example where uh, there are cameras. Can you see the cameras on the screen? Cameras on the screen are actually watching you watching something on TV, right? And if you show an interest in one of the, one of the actors, it can actually bring up information about them, like from the IMDB database. Um, it notices if you, if there's a scene in this where he looks down at this magazine and it automatically pauses, it can tell you're not looking at me. Um, so it pauses it automatically, you look up, it, it, it unpauses, right? So it does, there's some cool stuff like that. Um, this one is, um, so I'll let this thing go here. Um, this is a robot system. Traditional. Robots are controlled by complex remote devices, making their integration into that. Um, yeah, so on this robot, the, um, there are cameras on the robot, and they're watching hand signals. So it's a gesture-driven system. So when you do something like this, he follows you. You can do this. You can stop. He follows you down the hallway. If you just do this, he stops behind you. He can now walk into the office. When he comes back out, he does this, and he starts, starts following him again. Okay, so um, I just wanted to point out that these sorts of systems are absolutely multimodal. They, they span voice, vision, audio, gesture, all of it works. All of it works. All right, and I think this is really where, we're, where, where, where things are headed, where we're going to have really, truly multimodal systems moving forward. All right, so let me just finish up here. I can find out where I was. Um, so here's what I hope you remember. Uh, so most systems now, because AI is just so pervasive and it's built into so many toolkits, uh, I was telling you before, earlier about um, document processing. Different there are already massive training sets for document processing um, that Google maintains that as long as you're not selling a product, you can use for free. Um, whether you're processing legal documents, manufacturing, different, whatever industry you happen to be in, because you can imagine that they're, they're fine-tuned for that particular industry. Um, stuff's all available. All you got to do is plug into it, and magically, you start throwing documents. If I, if I plug into the legal library at uh, uh, what's called Google BERT, and I start pushing contracts through it, all of a sudden, it starts saying, hey, I know, I know what indemnification is. I know what the parties are. I know what the execution date is. I didn't teach it any of that. It knew it all. 
right, from the data sets, right? So this stuff is becoming ubiquitous. It's everywhere. And it's easy to plug into. You, you, good programmers go from nothing to an actual really legitimate, no kidding, intelligent interface in a day, right? They, 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 and they're not programming it. They're just plugging into it, okay? So this is going to be the norm. So what we're talking about today is now got to be a mainstream part of user interface design, not just an, oh, by the way, you might have some intelligence behind it. No, you're going to have some intelligence behind it. You've got to design for it. Um, if you're going to maximize the efficiency, you've got to figure out what has to be done by each of the parties and, make, and, and let them do what they do best. Get out of the way of the other guys so you can work together. Um, and um, there is a, an interactive software design process that with a minor little tweak, actually a focus on one, one particular part, the functional analysis, works really well at helping you develop user interfaces that really do amplify uh, the, uh, the symbiotic relationship between the user and the system. Okay, any questions?